Yeah, please share your screen. Uh, people are taking a seat right now. That looks good. Fantastic. Okay, give, give me just one second to find the mic. All right, and we're ready to go. Recording in progress. Welcome to this last session of Even High Dimensions. Uh, we have two more talks, which are on you know, the machine learning theory uh, side of things. And the first one, we're being joined by, by Noam Razim, who's uh, joining us online. And he's going to talk about generalization and deep learning, in particular sort of these low rank biases uh, that we can find in, in, in some of these networks. So Noam, thank you very much for joining us. Okay, so hi everyone. First Good. off, I'd like to thank the organizers for making this uh, wonderful conference possible, and I apologize for not being able to make it in person. So my research mostly focuses on theoretical aspects of deep learning, and indeed, as you can see from the title, today I'm going to talk about an implicit rank-lowering phenomenon and how it may shed light on generalization. I will cover results from the following three works, which were done in collaboration with Saf Maman and my advisor. Perhaps the biggest mystery today in the deep learning is how neural networks are able to generalize, even if we trade them without any explicit regularization. And this is despite the fact that often they're overparameterized. The number of learned weights can be far greater than the number of training examples. In these cases, we know that there exist many possible solutions, that is, weight setting for the network, which exactly minimize the loss, fit the data. Some of these will generalize well but others will not. And perhaps the magic here is how simple grain-based optimization methods, they lead us towards solutions, towards predictors that do generalize. The conventional wisdom around this is that grain descent and its variance, these optimization algorithms, they induce some form of an implicit regularization, which guides us towards predictors that are simple in some sense, meaning that they have low complexity for some complexity measure, which we don't quite know what it is. And so a major goal in the theory of deep learning is to mathematically formalize this intuition. Since tackling state-of-the-art neural networks can be difficult at times, we can start by looking at simpler settings and make our way forward, going towards models that are closer to what we have in practice. Perhaps the simplest setting of them all is linear regression. Here, when the number of learned weights is larger than the number of training examples, can we have more feature, features than samples? Then we have an infinitely many possible solutions but by what is now a folklore analysis, if we run gradient descent and initialize that zero, we don't just converge to an arbitrary minimizer of the loss, but rather to that which has the lowest Euclidean norm. Okay, out of all possible global minimizers, we get that which has the lowest norm. So in linear models, we have a norm which is implicitly minimized and we understand it well, but now the question is what happens when you go to more complex models? And today we're going to see this through the models of matrix and tensor factorizations. Of course, we'll discuss how exactly they relate to neural networks in deep learning, and we'll examine whether there we also have some norm that is being implicitly minimized, or perhaps it's something that is quite something else. And we'll start with matrix factorization. And here, one of the common test beds for studying implicit regularization is matrix completion. Okay, here we're given a sum subset of entries from an unknown matrix, and our goal is to predict the missing entries it is straightforward to see that completing a D by D prime matrix, that's the same as solving as a prediction problem over two discrete input variables. The first corresponds to the row index, okay, it takes values from one to D, and the second corresponds to the column index, it takes values from one to D prime. Through this correspondence, you can look at a value of an entry IJ in the matrix that we try to complete as the label of an input IJ. Okay, the inputs are just a pair of indices. The observed entries, that's our training data. The unobserved entries, that's our test data. And any matrix is simply a predictor. Okay, it's a lookup table that at each location holds the prediction for the corresponding input. We can go about solving matrix completion through matrix factorization, which refers to parametrizing our solution, our matrix, 
as a product of matrices, okay, W1 to WL, and fitting the observations using gradient descent. The objective here takes the following form. We have a sum over all observed entries, and for each one, we have the square difference between what we see, yij, and the value of our solution at the same location. Notice that I also don't have here any explicit regularization. In particular, the hidden dimensions between the matrices, they're large enough such that the rank is not constrained, and we can express any matrix. In matrix completion, we have an infinitely many possible solutions, right? Essentially, we can complete the matrix in any way that we would like, as long as we fit the observed entries. So what will determine which type of matrix we get, which type of solution we get, is exactly the implicit regularization at play of gradient descent. The main motivation of looking at this model from a deep learning perspective is due to the fact that matrix factorization that corresponds to a linear neural network, fully connected network with no nonlinearity. Okay, so although these are apparently simple, they still have highly non-trivial optimization and generalization dynamics and are still widely studied today. An empirical observation made a few years back by Gunnar Sikardal is that if the ground truth matrix that we try to complete has low rank, then just running matrix factorization from a small initialization near zero and with a small step size, this will actually lead to accurate recovery, even though there exist many solutions that will not generalize. And they conjectured that this accurate recovery is due to the fact that implicitly we are converging to the minimal nuclear norm solution. It's a nuclear norm, that's the sum of the singular values of the matrix. Why nuclear norm? This is based on classical results from matrix completion theory, which show that if you return the minimal nuclear norm matrix, you can get accurate recovery. Okay, so they conjectured that implicitly this is what is going on. And to be more formal, their conjecture is for gradient flow. It's a continuous variant of gradient descent. It's what you get when you take the step size towards zero. All the theoretical analysis that I'm going to show today will be for gradient flow. Okay, so this conjecture was proven for certain restricted cases, but it was not clear if this is something true more generally. And indeed, a couple of years later, a follow-up work suggested that maybe something more nuanced is going on, which cannot be explained through norm minimization. And that work, it examined the singular values of the matrix and how it behaves. So here we denote by WE the end matrix, that's the product of our weight matrices, it's the solution that we return. And by sigma MR, that's the singular values of the matrix. Okay, R, that's the index of the singular value, and M, that just stands for matrix factorization. What Aurora I'll show, this is the work that was, I was referring to, is that when we train a matrix factorization starting off from near zero using gradient flow, then the singular values evolve at a rate that is proportional to themselves to the power of something. And this has a profound impact on how they behave. It means that they're subject to a momentum-like effect where they will move slower when they're small because their rate of movement is proportional to themselves, which is something small, and faster when they're large. So as a result, since initially we start off near zero as common in practice, at first singular values will barely move, they'll move really, really slow, until each time one of them will reach a certain critical threshold, after which it will shoot up while the rest will stay stuck at zero. And then perhaps another one will reach some threshold, will shoot up while the rest will stay stuck at zero. So we'll get this incremental learning phenomenon, which you can also widely observe in practice. Okay, this is the singular values of the matrix, as opposed to the iterations of gradient descent. You see that one at the time, we learn the singular values, and this leads to solutions with few large singular values and many small ones. These are exactly low rank matrices. So the bottom line is that Aurora will show that there seems to be some form of an incremental learning phenomenon, which leads to low rank, and they conjecture that this is not something that can be captured by norm minimization, meaning that for any norm, we should probably be able to find some setting in which we don't reach that minimal norm solution. To put everything together, we saw here two opposing viewpoints. According to the first one, we have a norm that is being minimized, the nuclear norm. And according to the second one, no norm is being minimized. There's something a bit else going on. And now is where our work comes into play. Essentially, we aim to resolve this tension between the two viewpoints and check whether indeed we have some norm that is implicitly minimized. As the title spoils the surprise, what we showed is that no, actually there exist settings in which all norms will be driven towards infinity, and that is in favor of minimizing rank. So I'm not going through the full details of these settings, but they're actually quite simple. And if you take them in practice and run experiments, then you can also see 
that as the loss is minimized, all norms shoot up. This means that norm minimization cannot capture the implicit regularization in matrix factorization, but perhaps rank is a better interpretation. It's worthwhile mentioning here that also several other works have shown further support for an implicit rank minimization in these settings. Okay, so we saw that in matrices, matrix factorization, it's not clear, it's not exactly clear that we have norm minimization. In fact, there are cases in which provably we do not, and rank might be a better way forward. And now we'll see how this interpretation translates to more complicated models closer to practical neural networks. And now we're going to see this in tensor factorizations. And why would we want to do that? Well, although matrix factorization is interesting on its own behalf, as a surrogate for deep learning, it is inherently limited. First and foremost, it corresponds to linear networks, so it misses out on the crucial aspect of nonlinearity. The second limitation is more of the matrix completion setup, where if you recall, as a prediction problem, it corresponds only to a prediction over two input variables. And as we're going to see next, by moving from matrix to tensor factorizations, we'll actually be able to address both of these limitations in a way. So a tensor, for the sake of this talk, this is just a multi-dimensional array. Capital N here denotes the number of axes that we have. That's also called the order of the tensor. And we're going to look at a straightforward extension of matrix completion to tensors, known as tensor completion, where now we get a subset of entries from some unknown tensor, and our goal is to reconstruct it. Just as matrix completion can be seen as a prediction problem, tensor completion is also equivalent to a prediction problem, but now the number of input variables is n. It corresponds to the number of axes that the tensor has, and the number of values each input variable can take that is equal to the dimension of that. The correspondence here is the same as before, where the value of an entry in the tensor, that's the label of an input. The observed entry, it's the training data. The unobserved entry, the test data. And now each tensor is a predictor. There is nothing too profound going on here. It's just worthwhile noticing that prediction problems over discrete input variables, that's equivalent to tensor completion problems. Just as we can factorize matrices, we can also factorize tensors. And here we'll refer to by tensor factorization, we're parametrizing our solution as a sum of outer products and fitting the observation using gradient descent. The objective here is very similar to before, a sum over all observed entries. And for each one, we have the square difference between what we see and the value of our solution at the same location. Now, our solution is the sum of these outer products. Each wr1 to wrn, these are vectors. We take their outer product, we get an order n tensor. These are called components. And our factorization is the sum of these components. An important definition is the tensor rank, which is an extension of matrix rank to tensors. It, for a given tensor, its tensor rank is defined to be the minimal number of components that we need to express it as a sum of these components. Okay? So essentially, we can limit the tensor rank of the tensors that we get by using fewer components. But since we're interested in the implicit regularization at play, meaning at which solutions we get simply by running gradient descent without any explicit constraints, we consider the case where R here is allowed to be arbitrarily large and can express any tensor. The main benefit of transitioning from matrix to tensor factorization is that all matrix factorization corresponds to a linear network. It turns out that tensor factorization corresponds to a certain shallow nonlinear convolutional network with multiplicative nonlinearity. So still, it's not quite what we have in practice. The nonlinearity here is not ReLU or max pooling, but it does take us a step beyond commonly studied linear models. And this equivalence is not new. It has actually been extensively studied in the past in the context of expressive power. And now we're going to examine what is the implicit regularization at play in these models. The analysis here is going to follow a similar line to what we saw for the singular values in matrix factorization. We'll denote by sigma tr the norm of the these components. Okay, R, that's the index of the component, and T, that stands for tensor factorization. Recall that the number of non-zero components controls the tensor rank. What we show is that when we train a tensor factorization, starting off from new zero, then the norm of the components evolve at a rate that is proportional to themselves to the power of something. These dynamics are structurally identical to what we had with the single values in matrix factorization. And again, accordingly, it implies that we get this momentum-like effect where when they're small, they move slowly, and when they're faster, they move, and when they're large, they'll move faster. And again, we'll get this 
incremental learning process, where now we can see the component norms with respect to the iterations, or each time we learn a single component and the rest will stay stuck at zero. And this leads to solutions which have small number of non-zero components. That is, they have low tensor rate. We can also take this dynamical analysis a step forward and show under certain technical conditions an exact tensor rank minimization result. For example, if the tensor completion problem has a rank one solution, then under certain conditions, in particular, if the initialization is small enough, then we will reach that solution, meaning we will stay rank one for longer and longer, as small initialization is. Okay, so that was tensor factorization. And now we'll move on to the last model we're going to discuss today. And basically the reason to go there is that although tensor factorization takes us beyond linear predictors, it still lacks depth. Okay, recall that it corresponds to a shallow nonlinear convolutional network. It only has a single hidden layer. And it turns out that if we move from tensor factorization to hierarchical factorization, which I won't go into their exact definition, it's a bit technical, but what's important to know is that essentially they're a composition of many local tensor factorizations, and each of these local factorizations has components, which we call the local components of the hierarchical factorization. Then now, these factorizations correspond to certain deep nonlinear convolutional networks. It's deep variants of the same networks that we had before. So again, the nonlinearity is multiplicative, still not quite what we have in practice, but it's also not that far from it. And again, this equivalence is not new, has been extensively studied in the past in the same works that I mentioned before in the context of expressive power. All right, so just as tensor factorization induces a notion of rank which is controlled by the number of non-zero components, these factorizations also have their own notion of rank, which is called the hierarchical tensor rank. And I won't go into its exact definition, but it's important to know that if you can represent a tensor with few local components, then it has low hierarchical tensor. Okay, so motivated by the incremental learning phenomenon that we saw before, now we're going to examine what happens with the local components in these models. Okay, we'll denote by sigma hr, the Frobenius norm of the r's local component at some location, and k, that's the order of the component. You can think that this is some constant that is greater or equal than two. And what we see here is that we have the same phenomenon again, okay? We have the exact same dynamics where local component norms evolve at a rate that is proportional to themselves. As a result, this leads to the same momentum-like effect where they'll move slower when small and faster when large. And we again get this incremental learning process of now local components, which leads to low rank solutions. But now it's the different notion of called the hierarchical tensor. So to sum up the theoretical analysis part, basically we can put all the three models that we saw side by side and see how we have this nice analogy between the implicit regularization in all cases. Okay, in all models, we examine some quantity, singular values for matrix factorization, component norms for tensor factorization, and local components in the hierarchical factorization. In all of them, they evolve at a rate that is proportional to themselves. And this leads to this incremental learning process, which results in low rank solutions for the corresponding notion of rank. Bottom line is that we have this structural identity, identity between the implicit regularizations. Okay, so this concludes the theoretical analysis part. And in the time that I have remaining, I will briefly discuss some implications of this theory to modern deep learning. So first, a practical application is that if we take neural networks and parameterize some of their layers, okay, the linear weights or the convolutional weights, as one of the factorizations that we saw and run grain descent over this factorized form, then the analysis, they imply that we'll get low rank implicitly by grain descent, which means that we can compress this layer. And this is beneficial both for computational reasons and because it can boost generalization. And this application has actually found its way into practice and has been incorporated in several papers already. Okay, the second implication is more of a theoretical one. That's a possible explanation for generalization over natural data. So a major challenge in explaining generalization through implicit regularization is that we need to find complexity measures that are both implicitly minimized by gradient descent. Okay, this is the obvious criterion, which is often discussed. But equally as important, we also need these complexity measures to capture the essence of natural data in the sense that we need to be able to fit natural data with predictors of low complexity. Okay, because if we cannot, then even if we get the minimal complexity subject to fitting the data, 
it will still not really be low complexity and generalization bounds based on this measure may not tell us much. Motivated by notions of rank, in particular, the tensorial ranks that we saw being minimized in certain nonlinear convolutional networks, the question you ask is, can they serve as measures of complexity for explaining generalization? Basically, the question is, can we fit natural data sets with predictors of low tensorial ranks? And what we showed that, at least for these simple data sets, MNIST and Fashion MNIST, we indeed can. We can fit them with predictors of extremely low tensorial ranks, meaning that for the convolutional networks corresponding to tensor factorizations, an implicit regularization towards low rank actually explains generalization. We have this agreement between the complexity measure, which is implicitly minimized by gradient descent, and the complexity measure with which we can fit the data with low complexity. And both of these properties together ensure that we can get good generalization here of t. Okay, that was the second implication. And now the last one is a mix theory in practice. So we saw that in hierarchical tensor factorization, the hierarchical rank is minimized, but what does this even mean for the corresponding convolutional networks? Turns out that the hierarchical rank it measures the long range dependencies modeled by the network. If, for example, we're in an image classification task, it measures how strong we take into account relations between more distant patches of pixels in the image. So an implicit lowering of rank, this implies here an implicit regularization towards locality. Okay, it means that all long range dependencies will be weak and only local ones can be strong. And this gives rise to the question of whether we can use explicit regularization to counter this implicit bias to improve the performance of modern convolutional networks on long range tasks. And we show that this is indeed possible. We design an explicit regularizer motivated by our theory that promotes high hierarchical tensor rank, that is long range dependencies, and show that it can significantly improve the performance of modern convolutional networks, such as ResNets, on long range tasks. I mean that quite surprisingly, we can counter the locality of these overparameterized networks just by using explicit regularization without modifying the architecture, which is often believed to be missed. Okay, so now I'll conclude to wrap up the talk. These were the end of the implications. So to recap what we saw, the overarching goal was to try and improve the understanding of implicit regularization, even if by a bit. We started by looking at matrix factorization, which corresponds to linear networks. There we saw that the existing conjecture was that, is that a norm was implicitly minimized, but we showed that there actually exist settings where all norms are driven towards infinity in favor of minimizing rank. Then we moved to tensor and hierarchical tensor factorization, which correspond to certain nonlinear convolutional networks. And then we saw that also we have some notion of rank, which is implicitly lowered. And then we discussed implications to modern deep learning in this theory. We saw that by parameterizing layers of a network as one of the factorizations, we can get compression almost free. We saw that implicit rank lowering may have potential to explain generalization over natural data. And lastly, that we can counter the locality of convolutional networks just by using explicit regularization. And one final note to conclude what I believe is the main takeaway from this line of works. Basically, we saw if we zoom out three ty different types of neural network architectures, for which we have a notion of rank, which is implicitly lowered for the function that we, they realize. Okay? In each one of these cases, their function is represented either as a matrix or as a tensor, and it has a notion of rank that is being lowered for. And seeing this, we believe that perhaps more generally, in more complex models, whether it's transformers, recurrent networks, or residual convolutional networks, we also have some notion of rank for the function that they realize, which is implicitly low. And this hypothesis is a bit optimistic or perhaps a bit naive, but I believe there is quite a few empirical evidence that do point towards such a thing. And if this is true, then discovering these notions of rank may pave way to both explaining generalization, but not only that, also improving performance, either by designing regularizations or the architecture such that it aligns with the data. And with that, I'll finish. So again, thank you very much. And I'll be glad to answer any more questions if there are. Very nice talk, Noam. Thank you very much. I'm sure there's going to be some questions. And let's start right here. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was curious about, uh, you mentioned an experiment with the deep CNNs on long range tasks on which you managed to achieve uh, good performance by 
uh, you know, promoting a higher rank tensor. Can you tell us about that experiment? Yeah, so to be brief, essentially we use two different benchmarks for modeling long-range dependencies. I think the most simplest one you can think of, for example, say that I put two CIFAR10 images next to each other and I tell it to classify whether they're the same class or not. And then I create data sets where the two CIFAR images are more distant apart. This is just a controlled setting. And what you will see that if you run a standard ResNet, then it will, when they're close, they will, it will be able to generalize. But when the images are far apart, it will not generalize at all. It will be basically be as good as random guessing. And if you just add a certain regularizer, which promotes high hierarchical gravity, I didn't go into its exact definition, so uh, it's a bit hard to describe exactly what it does, but you can find, of course, the details in the paper. Then suddenly you are able to close this gap and generalize as well as you do on the local tasks on the more long range tasks. And you have a similar phenomenon in another benchmark for long range dependency. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, I see one there and one there, so I'm going to have to walk a lot. Uh, yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, my question, I guess, is about the, the theoretical results that you showed now. Uh, this, if I understand correctly, these are for square laws. Could you comment a little bit on what is known about, um, say, logistic laws? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So actually, uh, the square loss here was just for simplicity. The dynamical analysis that we saw, it holds true for any differentiable loss. And indeed, if you even run experiments for classification, you'll see a similar behavior. The question is, is what kind of results you can prove beyond just this dynamical analysis. For example, the tensor rank minimization result. And that was indeed for regression. So uh, I don't think much is known in terms of uh, rank minimization results for these models for classification. So it's, it's a very interesting problem. But the dynamics, they're similar across all sets. So you get this low rank bias uh, pretty much regardless of the loss in common setting at least, in everything that we try. Maybe if I can follow up on that question. <clears throat> I mean, it's quite striking. You had it on your summary slide too, right? It's really a very universal structure that you find, right? It's it's not just, it's even in the exponent, right? It's always this two minus two over, you know, the number of matrices or or the tensor rank or whatever. Can you give us a bit of an intuition on like in the gradient flow dynamics, like, what is it mathematically that always brings about this 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 structure, this particular form? Yeah, sure. That's an excellent question. So, in these particular models, it's the the fact that you have a product of multiple things. So. In matrix factorization, you have a product of L matrices. So the gradient of each matrix, it depends on all other matrices. That gives you L minus one terms. And then when you take the derivative or the single value of the norm, then you get this twice. And then you have this two minus two over L. And in tensor factorization, N is the order of the tensor. And again, you have this product, essentially. It's a slightly different operation, but you have products of N things. And then the hierarchical factors are the same thing. K here, it stands for the number of things that you take their product together. So it basically stands for the fact that you have a product of some number of things, and then their gradient depends on the size of all the rest. OK, I see. That makes sense. Thanks. OK. So we have two more questions, and then. I guess we have to move on. Hi, thanks very much for your talk. So my, my question concerns the part about uh, tensor factorization. So you show this uh, very interesting uh, phenomenon where you have this uh, sort of analog of the singular values, the component norms that uh, one by one start growing. And I was wondering uh, if you can tell something also about the, the, the overlaps. I mean, if you, if you assume that you're you have a, a, a data which is exactly a, a rank R a tensor, so we know that uh, under mild conditions you have uh, um, you know, uniqueness properties of these models, and in some applications we want to, to, to extract the, 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 the right directions in the space. So uh, are you able in this framework to, to, to say something about the, the overlaps that you get with this? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So 
the results that I displayed are just the dynamical analysis and then under a small initialization that you can get the rank one solution. But actually a follow up work, uh, an excellent work by uh, Ronge and colleagues, they do, they show for a specific uh, type of uh, ground truth tensor, it's an orthogonally decomposable tensor. They actually characterize this full stage where you learn one by one each of these components. So indeed for simple ground truth tensors, people have, not us, pe other people have characterized exactly this whole process. And I believe it's probably possible to do in other more general setups, but yeah, I guess it, it depends on the, indeed on the ground truth tensor. Right, thanks. All right, we'll have one last question for you, Noam, and then we'll let you go. Hi, I was wondering when you do your gradient descent, does the initialization matter? Also, uh, when you start state your matrix uh, completion problem or tensor completion problem, what is the sample complexity in your setting? Okay, so actually, first off, the initialization is crucial, and the fact that it is small, near zero. All these dynamics, they imply that when you're small, then you move slowly, and this leads to this incremental process where each time one of them will be large enough to shoot up. If you initialize large, then you will not get low rank bias because everything will be large and things will not go to zero. Um, so this is indeed crucial. Uh, and in terms of sample complexity, so we do not exactly do analyze uh, the exact reconstruction that you get here. These analysis are a bit asymptotic in the sense that, for example, the tensor rank minimization, it requires you to take the initialization towards zero. So this is indeed a hole that we still didn't fill in the theory. Getting exact uh, sample complexity results for how well you can reconstruct the tensor just by using the implicit bias. I know for matrices there are work that already did this, but for tensors I'm not sure. All right, let's thank Noam again. <laughs>